Hello, my name is Leslie Winnick, Director of Alumni and Student Class Outreach at the Stanford Alumni Association. I would like to personally welcome you to the 2016 Classes Without Quizzes series from Reunion Homecoming, a sequence of faculty-led talks designed to reconnect alumni with Stanford. This segment features Professor David Brady's Election 2016 talk. David Brady is the Bowen H. and Janice Arthur McCoy Professor of Political Science, the Morris M. Doyle Centennial Professor in Public Policy, and Senior Fellow at the Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. He's an expert on American political history, the U.S. Congress, U.S. elections, and political parties. Enjoy the talk. We're so glad you could tune in. So let me begin by saying that it's, uh, I'm going to start out with uh, some recent political history. And I want to begin by saying it's a pleasure to talk to a group of people who recent political history, you can actually go back to, say, Bill Clinton, and you know who that is, um, <laughs> as, opposed to, as opposed to the freshman classes. Um, OK, so <clears throat> you may remember in uh, 2000, this is just a background to this year's election. So, in 2000 uh, through 2004, the Republicans had won the President, House, and Senate, and uh, for the first time, had uh, lo- a long time period, uh, they had uh, controlled all three branches of the government for six years. And that led some people to think that there had been a switch in American politics. And so, Karl Rove uh, in The New Yorker, by the way, I did used to be a pretty good teacher till PowerPoint, and then I remember took a course on how to teach with PowerPoint. I think I paid, I don't know, 1200 bucks. And all I remember is don't read. But your every instinct is read. So, But anyway, the point was, in 2004, the Republicans felt like they were in pretty good shape. They controlled the government for six years. And uh, Karl Rove was talking about a realignment that looked like the one with McKinley in 1896. And those of you who are political junkies may know that Carl just wrote a book about the McKinley realignment, but that was his goal to create that. And so they thought they sort of had it. Then, then along came the 2006 election in which they lost 30 House seats, six Senate seats, <clears throat> and six governorships. They got thumped. 2008, Obama, it got worse. That led Democrats to say, <clears throat> James Carville's book. Now, that book is remaindered. I have books that are remaindered also, but mine got me tenure, so um, <clears throat> he, didn't, he didn't get tenure with his. So, so that, that didn't last very long. Apparently, a generation is shorter than it used to be, because in uh, 2010, the Democrats lost 63 House seats, six Senate seats, seven state governors. They lost 17 chambers in state legislature, and overall, 675 state legislative seats, one of the uh, largest, uh, since the 1930s, uh, largest defeat. Then, of course, that led the Republicans to think they would take over. But you have this uh, very interesting pattern. Uh, In 2006, you get the switch. Then 2008, unified government. 2010, unified. 2012, you keep the same. And then 2014, you switch back. Now, this is a lot of, um, this is a lot of instability, But uh, the point I want to make is that instability is not American. Do not think of this 2016 election as being a uniquely American thing. This is a standard measure of political instability across the six smaller European countries, Austria, Belgium, Greece, Ireland, Denmark, the Netherlands, from 45. And you can see that political instability in those countries is going up also. Now, Greece, obvious, but the others, uh, political instability. Now, if anyone actually wants uh, this definition of political instability, you could just email me at dbrady at Stanford. And so far, I've gotten one email. I've given about 20 talks on the election, one email. But I'm happy to explain it. And then this is uh, for uh, France, Germany, uh, Italy, and the UK. And, and you can see the way to think of it is like this. In 1951-52, in the United Kingdom, those elections that first took Churchill out and then put him back in, as prime minister, uh, 98% of the vote was cast for either the Labor Party or the Conservative Party. And in the last election, less than about 62% of the vote was cast for those two parties. There were six parties that got votes. UKIP, get out, Brexit. This is not an American phenomenon. This is a phenomenon that cuts across the board. 
and I'm not going to be able to say much about why that is, but the bottom line is that you should not think of the United States as... But if we, if we have to go back in American political history and look at a time where there was this much flip-flopping, it's essentially this, call, this now called the era of indecision, which was from 1874 to uh, 1896. And you can see how uh, there's no steady pattern. There's not a pattern where one party controls for a while and then the other. It flip-flops all around. And why is that? Well, my view is this was the first uh, period of globalization. This is the first uh, major transformation of world economies, and that shakes up jobs. It, it meant going into the, uh, before 1890, uh, right before the Civil War, rather, most jobs were in agriculture, and that people waited, uh, were uh, like uh, those British shows. They were uh, maids and so on and so forth. That was the major. By 1900, the majority of people in all the countries in the United States and Europe, uh, 40, 45% now worked in industrial jobs. Uh, so there's a huge shakeup, and in the shakeup period, you get a lot of political instability. In the modern period, those jobs have now gone. So all across Europe, all across the United States, in 1948-50, so I'm not the only one. See, 48, somebody know Truman was president. He won that election. In 1948, Harry Truman was able to win that election, basically running on, again, on the labor union issues, the, uh, repeal Taft-Hartley 14b. But the point is, in all across Europe and the United States, there was a, la- a party of the left, a labor party, and an anti-labor party. Now, that could be multi-parties, like in Italy, where it was always a question of the Christian Democrats and others in coalition. But in Britain, there was always a part, one party dominated by labor. And there were, As those jobs went away in the 70s, those industrial jobs went away, parties have to seek, how do I get a new majority? So the Democrats in the United States want to take the old blue-collar majority, and they want to put it together with academics and uh, academic liberals. That didn't always work out uh, in the steel mills and uh, so on. They like to hunt. Academics don't. So on and so forth. So uh, all across the OECD countries, parties are having a hard time putting together stable coalitions that were present in the 50s because these jobs uh, have disappeared. And nobody has figured this out. We do know that if the economy is doing well, stability is better. So if you look at that uh, graph before, Germany is doing better than Italy. And Austria is doing better than Greece. Now, most of the threat, the populism, uh, where, and, and what happens in these time periods is the economy changes, elites get out of touch with masses. And most of the populism now, all of it, is uh, from the right. And it's all about immigration. It's about immigration and cultural issues, etc. The only uh, left-wing populist party is in Greece. And so why would that occur? Because Greece, no one is going to Greece thinking they're going to get a job. All of the pressure in, in uh, Britain, Germany, the United States, is the pressure is jobs are being taken by immigrants. That's the view. And that's the threat. So all of the populism is from the right. And that was as it was in the uh, 18, 1890s also. So that, that's the background. That's the situation that's going on. So just a couple more little facts. This is, a, uh, uh, this is Gallup polls from 1937 to 2016. And each dot is a, special, is a Gallup poll. And uh, I just want to point out that what, when you look at this time series... The present instability, if you look at this time series, Democrats and Republicans are the major parties out of here, about a 10-point gap for the Democrats out of the New Deal. Very few independents. And you can see here's the, here's the uh, Kennedy, here's the Goldwater era. Uh, here's the coming back down, Republicans coming, then Nixon and Watergate, the drop again. But beginning in 1983-84, this is a huge difference that you can see between the past and now. At the present time, Democrats have about a little bit of an advantage on uh, party identification, but it's much, much closer now. And the rise of independents, now today you have more independents than you have actually Democrats or Republicans. And it's perfectly clear to see that party identification in the United States, the pattern has dramatically changed from Ronald Reagan uh, on, and it has not, it has not changed uh, at this point. That's another point to understanding what's uh, going on in this election. So what went on when this occurred? 
when we dropped down, Democrats dropped down, Republicans came up a little or didn't drop as much, and independents rose. What went on? Well, I call this sorting. And what do I mean by sorting? So at time one in the Democratic Party, you had like 50 liberals, 30 uh, moderates, and 20 conservatives. And here for, our, uh, for the Republicans, you had uh, 20 liberals. Now, it's nice to talk to an audience who, if I said Nelson, Rockefeller, William Scranton, you remember there were days when there were liberal Republicans. And there were days when there were conservative Democrats. So what happened is they sort out. So now there's 70 liberals, 30 moderates, 70 conservatives, and 30 moderates. And there are no conservatives in the Democratic Party, and there aren't any liberals in the Republican Party. So that makes American political parties more like European political parties in that they're, uh, they're, they're set. So what happened during that drop back is there's a sorting and then the number of people who say I'm independent because I, I don't want to, I'm not as, most people who are independent are economically more conservative than Democrats and socially more liberal than Republicans. That's where independents are and they're not too happy with either party. Yeah, I see a number of people pointing themselves and I would point the same way. Okay, so now we get to the, now we get to the actual nominee. And let me say, I was not, uh, none of my colleagues that I know, none of, no one, not one of us guessed that Donald Trump would be a serious presidential candidate, nor did any of us guess that Bernie Sanders would be the anti-Hillary uh, candidate, to be honest. Now, it turns out that that's a break for research, which I'll show you in a minute. Here's how Americans are thinking these days. Uh, the question basically says, you know, uh, some people think uh, quite a few people in Washington are crooked, some people think not very many are. Some think, well, hardly anyone. Well, here's the percentage of people who think a lot of people are crooked. So now you know there's some differences. In the Bush era, the Republicans thought there were fewer criminals. And now in the present era, fewer Democrats think they're crooks. But the bottom line is that number has risen, and it's pretty high. Here's the number of people who think, uh, and this is the question here is, Government's really run by a few big interests for special purposes, and it doesn't really have much to do with people like me. You can see there are some differences between Republicans and Democrats, but at the present time, Republicans, Democrats, and independents are all there. So that's, uh, I, you wouldn't call that happiness. Uh, I can show the same figures in European countries that I showed, and they, they turn out to be, questions are a little different, but the answers are essentially the same. So here is uh, percent believing government run for the benefit of all. Now, that uh, Republicans thought under Bush it was big. Democrats didn't think so much. But now, again, notice, nobody thinks that. And here is uh, government care, doesn't care much about me. And you can see that uh, since the 2008, which is a big event in each one of these, you can see big drops or big rises. And so in 2000, from 2008, the number of people who think government doesn't care much about them, that's written. So that's a context. Which, and if you ask people questions, there's a whole set of others I could put on. Like you ask people, well, how many people believe that politicians will lie to get elected? Well, like 58% say, oh, yeah, right. Now, I have one other question to ask you. So, by the way, I should point out that the data I'm showing here comes from uh, the YouGov economist surveys. I'm not paid by them, but I am an advisor to them, and I do that so I can get their data. But the bottom line is that we run these polls, and this is most of the data I'm showing you is from what we call what was the recontact survey, and that we have interviewed the same 5,000 people every month since May. And that allows us to track real changes as opposed to most polls, which are just cross sections. So you can get changes, but they're in the aggregate, and you don't know who changed. So we did an anger poll. How many people in this audience hear or read something in the news? that makes you mad, angry, on at least a daily or uh, more than once a day basis? Well, you're with most Americans because the number for America is about 60% of Americans hear or read something that makes them angry. I guess I'm blessed by being a cynical political scientist. There's very little that makes me angry or surprising. So now, uh, basically, the story of the two campaigns for the nomination parties is You've got the establishment and the anti-establishment. Democrats are easier because, in this case, the establishment candidate wins. So why wasn't it just another coronation for Mrs. Clinton? And the answer is, we all knew one thing. There would be an anti-Hillary candidate because she's not that popular. So here's her rating among, this is in July. Her rating of Democrats viewed her pretty favorably. But even there, 14% of Democrats said they'd never vote for her. And among independents, crucial, as you'll see, 
Uh, 64% had an unfavorable view. 39% say, and Republicans, forget it. There's just no, there's no, as you can see. She's not getting many votes there. So we knew it would be someone. No one thought it would be Bernie Sanders, an outsider who'd only been in Congress for 30 years, um, <laughs> an outsider socialist. No one thought it would be him. So we asked a question about what, what seemed to drive his campaign what drove his campaign was people who thought there was great inequality and the 1% had too much. So this is a question we ask, and this is among people who believed that the U.S. economy favors the wealthy too much. Now note, even this group, among Democrats, people who said, I'm a Democrat, uh, Ms. Clinton beats Sanders by eight points. But among independents, she gets killed. And here, fair to uh, most, uh, fair to, it's, the economy is fair to most. She does even better, and he doesn't do so there. And those who weren't sure, well, we're not sure about them. So, but he, she does better. So the point is, she had Democratic support. He had independent support. He had a support of unbelievable numbers of students. Because you can see why the average Stanford student would be quite upset about the 1% having too much, because obviously they... <laughs> Obviously, they're not in that group, right? Okay. So she gets through. She comes, she comes up somewhat damaged. Now, now Trump. So in May, we're sitting around trying to figure out, okay, there's 900 or 19 or 38 Republican candidates. Who are we going to list? Who are we going to list? So Donald Trump's name comes up. Well, a lot of smart political scientists, there are no question. We're not listing him. He's not serious. He's going nowhere. Good, right? So... Now, we just finished a study of seven European countries, and in those countries, we found out the most, the best, one, of the, the, one of the two best predictors of anti-immigration was, if you ask people, How, how's your family economic situation? Did it get better or worse over the last year, or two years, or three years? If people thought their family economic situation was worse, they were much more anti-immigrant than people who thought it stayed the same or people who thought it had gotten better. Well, that was great, because it turns out we didn't have... Oh, sorry. Back up a minute. Here's the way the Republican primary... Remember, I want you to remember 2012. The Republican establishment. The way it usually works for Republicans, Romney was the establishment candidate. Then first, Michelle Bachman. Remember her? Boom. Then next is... Uh, who is this? Oh, yeah, Cain, the, the executive. He was in for a while, and then it turns out he had affairs or something. Then after that, it was Perry, and then he forgot who he was cutting. And then after that, it was Newt and so on and so forth. But in the end, it was like a King of the Hill game where it was Romney and them and, Ro- and, the, and the other person fell away and the establishment candidate won. So that's what we were expecting for this time. So now this is among people who thought that their economic... Uh, 38% of Republicans thought that their economic situation was worse over the past year. That's a pretty big hunk. And when we asked, you know, who are you for... Their first choice was no preference. <laughs> they had uh, Scott Walker was there. He had 12 or 13%. But you may recall he dropped out. Everybody else you see has got a little, but there's no big preference. Then Trump made his uh, speech about the wall and so on. So we include, now we put Trump's name in, of course, cleverly, after he's leading the pack. <laughs> so who says we can't adapt? So now note that of these people, Trump is the leader by far. He's at 41%. And that's been the core of his support. So Trump's, the core of Trump's support has always been people who are disaffected with the economy. That's been his core support. And uh, I'll show you another example of this. This is not quite the same people. But here are people I call, I call less affluent Republicans. What's that? These are Republicans who have high school or less, uh, are less degree, and they make less than $50,000. And as you go down each one of our polls, they are much more supportive of Trump than any other Republicans. And in the end, by July, they're about 20, 21 points higher. So early in the game, the Republicans' primary had done two things. They changed two things. From 2012, they thought it dragged out too long and kept Romney in the spotlight, too many people in. So they pushed the primary count up earlier, so they got more delegates counted earlier. They wanted to get it over with earlier. And the second thing is they went back to more, they went back to basically more winner-take-all primaries with varying formats. And that helped Trump because in the early primaries, with 17 candidates, he's at 22, 23 percent, makes him the leader. Then there's the fight between who's going to be the anti-establishment candidate. 
It's uh, Ted Cruz wants to be, uh, Carly Freerina wants to be, Dr. Carson wants to be, Trump wants to be. And on the other side, they're fighting out to see who's going to be the establishment candidate. Bush, Rubio, etc. A lot of fighting, a lot of going on. And in the end, Trump continued to benefit because he had the solid base of support. And at the end, Ted Cruz was the establishment candidate. So the bottom line is we don't know if this is a repeatable phenomenon, but we do know that in both the Democratic and Republican parties, the elites are way ahead, uh, are too far ahead of the base of their parties, and that has caused caused some shakeup, okay? Now, here's the unfavorable ratings of candidates, uh, presidential candidates from 1956 to the present. So uh, they started, both of them started out pretty unfavorable, and over the course of the campaign, it got more unfavorable, so you can see this is Goldwater, 47, 47. There's two things as you look from 1956 on, the average, just the average unpopularity rating. Trump and Clinton are by far the most unpopular candidates since 56. This is, this is not news to you, is it? Good. Okay. Now, note, the second thing is that uh, kind of post this era where I argued that uh, the parties became more like European parties, they... Uh, uh, Note that in, back in this period, Nixon, uh, uh, say even Humphrey, uh, Humphrey Nixon, 28, 22, Carter Ford, 16, 20. Nobody disliked these guys. Now note that it doesn't, it hardly ever gets below 40. A popular candidate is like 38% don't, don't like them. So under that, the new party system, you get your, uh, much more likely to get uh, a higher, higher sort of numbers. So We have uh, unpopular candidates running for president. Now, the elections. So let's do some basics. Since this is turnout, uh, and I'll start here in 1828. There's funny reasons why that's true, but you you don't want to know. So, well, actually, that's Andrew Jackson. And once you get the party system and it gets straightened out in the 1832 Census Act and single-member plurality districts, that's what accounts for that. But note that over the entire time period, on average, an off-year election is about 14 and a half, 15 percent lower than a presidential election. So in a presidential election, not going to look like 2014, not going to look like 2010. They're going to be a different electorate. So what does that electorate look like? Here it is. You can see the electorate. uh, This is 2004, 12 and 16. So you can see that the electorate gets less white. It gets more uh, black. It gets more Hispanic, and I think that number is probably low. That could go as high as a 13. Gets more Asian, gets more other. So this was Barack Obama's winning percentage in 2012. And so if we were to do the same, same election and everybody voted exactly the same, given the demographic shifts alone, just, just the demographic shifts, now uh, the Democrats have a 5.4% advantage because there are now fewer whites more African-Americans, more Latinos, uh, more Asians, and so on. All those groups tend to be uh, more Democratic. So you can see that there are two things happen. The electorate, uh, there's less turnout, and the turnout in a presidential election year favors Democrats. And just a quick uh, example, this is the Latino vote. So you can see in Arizona, Latino vote is uh, important. It's what makes it still up for grabs. Colorado is uh, uh, now going to be a Democratic state. And the reason is because uh, Colorado has, uh, has changed. Florida, I believe that Florida polls are close. I believe Florida will uh, go for Mrs. Clinton. And the reason is, is this increased number of uh, Latino voters and the fact that the old Cuban-American vote, the younger, younger Cuban-Americans are not anywhere. They're, they tend to be Democratic, not Republican. They don't remember the old Cuba and sort of the changes in policy have shifted their vote. And there's Nevada, and uh, that makes the Nevada Senate race exceedingly hard to call because uh, large number. And then you have to. So then the question we have to ask is who's going to turn out? And I'll come. I'll come back to that later. But the point is, if I did that for African Americans, whoever I do that for, you can see that those changing demographics, particularly in the uh, competitive states, matter. So the bottom line of that is, ele- uh, Republicans have an electoral college deficit. And so no one thinks, or there's, there's no one here thinks that California is going to vote for Trump, is there? <laughs> there's no one thinks that uh, Alabama's going for Ms. Clinton. Okay. So if you look at this, look, there might be, so, so I have Ohio, India. There's a few states that are blind. 
But, and you might, you might want to say, well, New Mexico might be more competitive. But the bottom line is that Democrats going in have, given the demographics of the states and the way things work, they have 30, 35 vote electoral college advantage going in going into the Electoral College because of the sort. Now, you, we could disagree about how much it is, but my point is only that because of the turnout rates and what I've talked about, they have, they have a deficit going in. Now, let's talk about the election. Elections used to be pretty easy to do. I see Ken down there, and if, uh, he remembers the days when you could just do that. There, what you just do, this is a quote from a book by Lynn Vavrick, and this is not Lynn's, very good book, but it's the blurb from the jacket, and it basically says... The economy determines everything, and we can. Start. And those models were all retrospective, and they essentially worked like this. It says, okay, so when I'm going into the ballot, or when you're going in to vote, basically, on average, you look and say, gee, how's the economy doing? And if the economy did pretty, is doing pretty well, and you're doing pretty well, you say, okay, I'll reward the president or the president's party. And if the economy is doing badly, you say, well, you're out. And so there are a number of models that do this. I'm not going to go through them all, but I will show the one that is the most famous, and this is called the FAIR model, uh, named after Ray FAIR, who's an economist at Yale. Now, that's the actual vote, and that's the predicted vote from 1916 through 2008. Now, all he knows, the only formula that is here is this. It says, what is the real, in in the two quarters prior to the election, what is real growth in income minus the GDP deflator? So I know what real growth in income is. And what are the number of good news quarters uh, in, the, in the last 16 quarters where the growth rate was over 3.2%? That's an amazing record. He doesn't know who the president is, doesn't know who's popular, doesn't know anything. All That's all he knows. And look at that. That's, that is an amazingly, for, for uh, social science, that's like great. I mean, that's, that's really good. Um, and, then, uh, and then 2012, they started to go bad. Uh, the model predicted 49% for Obama. It was 2 3% off. And there's one other. There's a bread and peace model because a uh, second model by a man named uh, Doug Hibbs, a very good scholar. And Hibbs says, well, it's true the economy matters. And the last two, three quarters are very important. But another thing that matters is, what are the number of U.S. troops abroad engaged in common? And when he does that, look at that line from 80 on. Boy, he doesn't miss anything, does he? Really close, except 2000, Al Gore, worst campaign ever. (laughs) So, but here's 2012. His prediction is, which he's absolutely certain of is, Barack Obama will get 44, 44, 45% of the vote. And here's Ray Fair's prediction For this year, now that was as of uh, a week ago, so it might be 44 now. But at any rate, why why did they start to go wrong? And here's why. Remember, I told you they're retrospective models. So people go into the, you're assuming people go in and they say, oh, the economy's doing pretty well, or it's doing badly. Now here is the YouGov, the stuff I've been talking to you about, polls. Here are polls from 2008 through 2012. How is the economy improving? So you can see it goes up, goes back down, slips down a little bit, goes like that. So that seems normal. And if you actually, I put the economic data up, it, it pretty well fits. Only trouble is, it depends on who you ask. There's Democrats. They think it's great. There's Republicans. That sucks the whole way, as you can see. <laughs> and here's independents right in the middle. Now, the problem is, if people walk in and they perceive the economy differently, the retrospective model can't work. Because if I go in and I think the economy is great, and you go in and you think it's bad, then we don't have the same impression of the economy. And the model that says you and I are smart enough to figure out whether the economy is doing bad. So now there's a problem with that. Probably when you have growth rates right between 1% and 2 2.5%, you're in an area where that's more true. I believe if it was 8% growth or 8% loss, the, the models would work fine. But the problem is, in the past, they worked pretty well with those slower growth rates. So we now have data back to 1992, uh, where there were no. This difference began to show up in about 2005 with the Bush, uh, George W. Bush administration, second administration. That's when we began to see differences in people's perception of how well the economy is doing. We have not, um, we have not analyzed uh, that data in uh, 
with a really hardcore econometrics that would be able to uh, allow us to sort this out. Okay, so then if the economy doesn't predict so well and the party, so, so how, how did Obama win? Uh, so my view is this is how he won. So there are 38% Democrats, 32% Republicans, and Obama won 92%. 7% uh, Democrats uh, voted for Romney. Romney uh, got 93% of Republicans and 6% of, uh, uh, de- 6% voted for Obama. But that meant, essentially, since they split that, that meant coming out of that, uh, that 70% of independence, that meant uh, Romney had to win about 60%. Now, he won, uh, but he didn't win big enough, so they lost. So the way to think about it is, how many Democrats are there? How many Republicans are there? How well do the candidates hold? And then how well do they do among uh, independents? So that's, that's where I'm going. And you can see now that uh, Clinton and Trump, uh, one advantage for the Democrats is they now have an eight-point lead, 36-28. But and Mrs. Clinton has about 88% of Democrats. 5% are going for Trump. 28% are, uh, for, uh, are Republican. Uh, 81% uh, are for uh, uh, Trump. And so that means Mrs. Clinton has a higher percentage of a bigger number going in. And that means that uh, among the 36% independents, that she has to, uh, he has to do uh, exceedingly well. And at this point, he's, uh, they're, they're about, we have him a little bit ahead. Uh, it's 37, 36, so it's a draw. So on that basis, and, but what lies behind that are groups. So here's, uh, man, so Obama won uh, Romney won men by seven points. Mrs. Clinton won women by 11 points. And then, uh, again, among whites, you can see the big differences. And here's the breakdown with Clinton and Trump. So they all pretty well hold up till you get down here. That is what I mean by hold up. Romney, uh, among white voters, Romney won by 20 points. Trump is winning by 14, uh, by uh, 12 and uh, black voters are much more in favor of Mrs. Clinton than they are Trump. Hispanic voters are more in favor. Until you get down here. Obama won high school voters, 53-47. Trump is winning them uh, by 11 points, or by 12 points. And this is the percentage of the electorate they are. And college graduates, for the first time since uh, we've been doing this, uh, since uh, basically we'll probably get it back to 48, college graduates, for the first time, are voting for uh, Ms. Clinton. Now, I've never seen education play such a role, and I did want to, I, I just, so you could combine these things in different ways, and so just before I came over, I decided to do this. So you might expect, given this election, that the gender gap would be really high. Well, here's why it isn't as high as you think. If you're a white woman with a high school or less degree, they are for Clinton, 25, Trump, 40. If you're a white woman, college graduate, Clinton, 59, Trump, 23. Men, white men, high school or less, Clinton, 30, Trump, 48. White men, college, Clinton, 47, Trump, 32. So education has never played uh, as big a role uh, in elections as I have seen it play this time when you divide that high school. And high school or less is basically the equivalent of how much money you earn, et cetera, correlated so highly. So I could do that with 50000 a year or less, but uh, the education variable. So it's quite, um, quite, quite unusual to have uh, uh, these sorts of results. This is just uh, showing a little bit of the pattern of our YouGov poll over time. So you can see last, this is after the first debate. Mrs. Clinton picks up about two, three points. Trump stays at about 80. She starts to rise. We still have Trump, we, you gov, we still have Trump up a little bit among independents. If you give these talks, and I, I'm very objective about these talks, I'd rather get it right in that sense. So I thought I'd show, so I called Darren Shaw, who's the Fox pollster and a friend. So I'm showing the Fox poll, so I've now covered everything. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a good poll. Uh, so you can see, I'm, I'm showing you the same thing, party vote, Okay. Here's Democrat uh, voters are 81%. I told you we have, we have about 85% in the most recent. Democrats, Hillary Clinton and Tim Klein, 6%. Uh, Donald Trump, might 5 and 80. So again, uh, the results show that Mrs. Clinton 
has a slightly higher percentage of a bigger number. There's a nine-point gap. They have a nine-point gap. They, uh, Fox Poll has more, 9% more Democrats than Republicans. And then here's what they have is independents. Yeah, so they have an even, dead even, 35 and 35. 35, 35. And again, uh, but we have, as I just told you, we, we have them up. So by my way of reckoning, if the election were held today, oh, and here's a last graph that we made. Where does their support come from? So the blue is uh, support from the regular party members. That part comes from independents, and that little red bar comes from Republicans. Trump support from Republicans, from independents, and, from, and the difference between this line and that line is the difference in the election. So you can see sort of the, Democrat, the Democrats' big advantage is what's giving uh, Mrs. Clinton the lead she has in the polls. Now, I do not think that uh, she has a seven or eight point lead. I think, uh, I think she has four, four and a half point lead, something like that. Reasonably solid based on, on what I've been telling you. So the one thing, okay, the one thing we don't have, this election, I think because both candidates are so unpopular, there's a much larger number of people who say they're voting for a third party candidate or they're undecided than we have had in quite a long time. So depending on how you measure it, that's 11%, 16%, 17%. So what we want to do is we'd like to know if they switched, and they usually do. So if you look at, say, George Wallace's vote in 68, it falls down. Ralph Nader's vote falls down in 2000. Ross Perot's vote falls down, so on. Over time, as you get to the election, people think, I don't want to waste my vote, I'm going to. So we need, but we need to try and figure that out. So what we did was... We pulled apart the people who were, said they were undecided or were voting for a third-party candidate and, and try and force them to answer this question. If you had to choose, would you be more likely to vote for Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump? This was in August, and uh, 3328 among registered voters. This, I just got this, uh, I, I just looked at the latest uh, update, and so I don't have the question, but that's, that's the result. So we still have among these people a good hunk of them who are not going to choose. And when we try to look at the difference between them, they don't like either candidate very much. Um, So we don't know what's going to happen to them. And if we had to make a guess what happens on the break at the end when they start to break, it looks like based on this data that voters would break toward Mrs. Clinton, but we can't be absolutely certain of that. Okay. So what do I, if the election were held today, what does it look like? I mean, this is a real clear politics that uh, those of you who are political junkies know about. And so real clear politics, they have some states that are still up for grabs, et cetera. But that's, that's their view. Uh, there are 113 states all still up for competition. So Mrs. Clinton needs uh, only some combination to get 10 more votes, and she's in. And I think people mainly agree that it's harder for Trump to get to 270 than uh, Mrs. Clinton. This is... Um, Sabato's crystal ball, and he has her at 352 and Trump at 173. I'm not sure. I think probably, I, I don't think Utah is going to go. Utah may go for the other guy. McMullen, uh, he's within one point of Trump. It's 30-29. I don't think Ms. Clinton's going to win that state, but McMullen might win it. Georgia, so on. Uh, but it, the, these are just uh, things to look at, so I, I, I don't need to go any further. I made the point that the Electoral College advantage sort of goes to her. All right, how about the Senate. So here's the, here's the uh, YouGov prediction. The Senate is now 46-46 with Nevada, New Hampshire, Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, they say, is uh, up for grabs, etc. That's, that's not my view. I will show you in a minute. So I think it looks a little bit more like this. So I think Missouri will go. Now I can say all this because if I'm wrong, what can you do to me? Um, <laughs> Uh, I'm not getting paid for this. Um, so, and, and I'm too old to be back in four years. So that's, uh, so I think Missouri will go, I think pretty uh, sure Missouri will go Republican. Florida will also go Republican. Uh, Pennsylvania, I think, goes uh, Democratic. Indiana goes Democratic. And uh, New Hampshire goes Democratic. And Florida goes Republican. Nevada is... The polls in Nevada are not very good. And uh, so uh, I don't know. It's called, we just did one in Nevada. Ours is good, of course. But um, it showed a dead tie. 
So I, I really can't comment. So I, I have the Democrats at 50, and I have the Republicans at 49, but they could draw at 50. But I, I would say that Pennsylvania uh, is still a chance uh, for the Republicans. I wouldn't bet, I wouldn't bet uh, any of my daughter's lives on it. North Carolina, uh, I uh, could also go Democratic, but I, I think it will go Republican. And Missouri is also really, really close. So uh, on the margin, you can't tell. But my, uh, I, my guess is the Democrats have 50 or 51 seats. Uh, now, if all the movement at the end, if all those voters, have mo- they all move toward Mrs. Clinton, it could go as high as 53, 54. They could sweep them all. But that would include Arizona, and that would mean John McCain would lose. So I don't, I don't believe that's true. Um, no applause at that. Um, now, here's the House. The best guess. So how do you think about the House? The Democrats, the Republicans, Democrats have to win 30 seats. And so uh, this is kind of the real clear politics average. You have 237, 231. On this basis, they've already got 207 that are set, and they've got this many. So the bottom line is they're, they're predicting that they lose, you know, 10, 12 seats. I, I think the more accurate one, way to think about it is this. They have 37 seats here, Charlie Cook and others. These are the 37 seats that look like they're most vulnerable. They could, they could, they could lose those. Now, there's one that was safe Republican uh, that uh, is, is open, so it make it 38. But that would mean for the Democrats to win this, they would have to take 31, they had 31 of these 37 seats. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's even if the, there's a huge swing that way. So my guess is the House of Representatives, the Democrats gain up to 20 seats. Uh, they do not lose the House of Representatives. One thing about the House of Representatives, and this is a point for a Stanford audience, you can't do this most places. So uh, one of the things people look at is they look at that generic ballot and they say the generic ballot shows Democrats up by five or six points. And uh, what does that mean? And then some people will try and interpret that, Democrat, uh, that generic ballot, and they will say, oh, that means 28 points, it's 20 seats, etc." Here's why it doesn't work that way. So notice the Democratic vote share, 96, 98, 2000, 2002, 2006. Notice that for the Democrats to the right of 75, they always have a number of seats that are out there. Note for the Republicans, they never have anybody out there. That means... That means that the Republicans win more seats with fewer votes, where Democrats need more votes for fewer seats. And the reason for that is there are between 65 and 73 majority-minority districts that are either African-American or Latino, and those districts are the ones that are heavily represented out here. And so that means that the Democratic vote is spread more broadly across the thing. And so uh, for the Democrats... Generic ballot lead means one thing, and for the Republicans, it means something else. So that generic ballot stuff, I think it has to be around 10 or 11 for uh, the Republicans to lose the House of Representatives, and the average is about five. All right, with that little technical point, I quit. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Questions? So can you talk about voter turnout, what you think is going to happen, and how it could impact this whole thing? Um, both because I think the Democrats have a much more organized, on the other hand, there's also an uh, excitement factor. Yeah. So we've always believed, uh, as political science, we believe, we're always offering these explanations that Bush won in 2004 because he put a better team together, and they went out and registered voters that were Republican, et cetera. And in Obama in 2008 and 2012, and one of my students, Harry Hahn, has a very nice book on arguing that um, Republic, a Democratic organization in 2012 uh, generated 2.5% more vote for, uh, uh, for, for President Obama. Now, this is a wonderful year for us for the reason you just suggested. The Democrats have lots of money. They have lots of people on the ground. Every battleground state... They're loaded in Florida. They're loaded in Missouri. They're sending people to Arizona now. They're loaded in those states. And the Republicans have almost nothing. So this is going to be a great case study. How much of a difference does it make? And the question you asked about, but there seems to be more, some more enthusiasm on the Trump side. Well, how much of a difference will that make? That, uh, if you ask me that question three months from now, I can answer it. <laughs> but... And the point is, it's a really good question, and it, dep- it hangs, and uh, I think it'll make a difference. 
I just want to add to yeah. this. Do you think there's an enthusiasm improvement since that nasty comment and we have the women in the pantsuits going you over know, Brooklyn Bridge? You know, I, I got to tell you, so we have been wrong. We, we have been wrong. Uh, all of us, a group, there's a group of us, Democrats, Republicans, independents, trying to study elections. We have been wrong all along on Trump. There were 13 times we said, well, I can't get by with saying that. <laughs> And we've been wrong. So we put together a special panel of 20,000 people to watch the first debate, second debate, first debate. So we, have, we know who they are. Now, the first debate, she got a 2% bump. The second debate, no one changed their mind. No one changed their mind. And I haven't seen the – we're in the field now with the second debate, third debate. But I, I – uh, if, if there's a change, it's going to be less than, less than 1%. And if you may have noticed, the polls are now tightening. She had a six, seven point lead. Now they're coming back to four, 4%. Four why is that? Well, I don't believe them. And, and here's why. So what happens when you do a telephone poll, right? After the first debate, uh, so I'll, I'll do it with a better example. In 2012, that first debate, no matter, you can be, well, it was clear Mitt Romney won that debate over uh, Barack Obama. And after that, after that, suddenly he, uh, Romney was up in the polls. He was uh, three, four points ahead. And you remember President Romney. He did not win. <laughs> what happened was, after that, you know, you have to make 10, 15, sometimes 20 calls to get a respondent on, on a phone call. Well, who was more willing to talk? Republicans. So it oversampled Republicans. So what's happened, I believe, on these polls that Miss Clinton did pretty well. Republicans thought, oh, my God, Trump, why couldn't he not say anything? So they're not, they're not responding on the polls. So as a, a three or four days pass, the numbers come back down to, that's why I believe the numbers are more like four, four and a half percent. I don't think they're six percent. And I think these jumps and the reason they fall back down is who's responding on, on, the, uh, who's responding on the questions. Yeah, John. Dave, could, could we get your view on uh, two subjects, one of which is the real history and numbers on voter fraud at the polls, yeah. and then secondly, more broadly, on voter suppression, voter ID laws, and sort of systematic stuff there, and your view on these th- issues? Are you trying to get me in trouble with a certain... Uh, uh, that's okay with me. I have tenure and I'm old. Who cares? Um, <laughs> so I can retire. I think, look, voter fraud is almost impossible to study. Most people aren't going to tell you. They're not going to say, oh, yeah, I, I voted six times. <laughs> so I, my view is it doesn't affect elections very much. Uh, it, it doesn't affect. There's a deal that could be made. We now have the technology, say, in Chicago, where they haven't scrubbed the rolls. There's technology that scrubs voter rolls that would let you uh, eliminate people who haven't voted in uh, 10, 12 years, something like that. But on, and on the other hand, the trade-off would be, okay, no, you don't need so many voter IDs and all that sort of thing. But neither party will agree to that because each thinks it has some advantage in the other way. But in my view, uh, in the long run, that is not going to determine this election. And if it had determined any election, it was maybe 1960. But and we don't even know that. So I, it's not, I do not lose any sleep over that at night. But then I'm not running. Um, As you see the, the rise of independence and people that are more socially... Uh, liberal than most of the mm-hmm. Republicans, more fiscally conservative than most of the Democrats. Do you see the possibility of a third party coming up or maybe a presidential candidate who's an independent that you know, that demographic? That's a great question, and I've always been a fan of third parties. And so all the time I'm getting them at YouGov to put Michael Bloomberg in. Perfect guy, conservative, might well be conservative fiscally, liberal socially, blah, blah, blah. And we get him in. Every once in a while, and he gets like 4%, 7%. And, and why is that? I think the answer is because in the United States, it's easier to take over a political party than start a new one. Look, look what happened with Donald Trump this time. I mean, basically, the whole entire top, uh, Republican Party establishment was not in favor of him, and they took over. So third parties are hard to do because you have to start at the grassroots. You have to run congresswomen, congressmen, senators. So generally, it's easier to take a party over. Yeah. You talked about the impact of the election on the, on the presidency and the House and the Senate. Yeah. But there's an increasing movement both from the right and the left to mobilize states to do what states did when they forced Congress to propose the Bill of Rights, yeah. constitutional reform. On the left, you have Citizens United. 
On the right, you've yeah. got a balanced budget effort, and mm -hmm. you've got uh, a bunch of uh, people now that are pushing for an amendment to require that Congress approve major new federal regulations, which yeah. I happen to be involved in. Say that again. Um, I, I, I just... I, the, an amendment called the Regulation Freedom Amendment to require that Congress approve yeah. major new federal yeah. regulations is yeah. in the Republican platform, and 900 legislators are for it. The question is, how do you think that these, all these different currents and turnout patterns will reflect themselves in the balance of state legislatures. Right now, 69 are controlled by Republicans, yeah. uh, more than two-thirds. Uh, how do you think this that will play out at the state legislature? I think level? the Democrats on the so Democrats will pick up a little bit, but I don't think it'll have a, I don't think it'll have a big effect on those election races because, as you know, Republican governors can do well in Democratic states and vice versa. The gov uh, governors, because governors, you know, governors when they campaign, they sound like MBAs. They don't. They can talk about this, uh, this trade-off, etc. I am, in terms of your general question a bit uh, more worried about the, the number of Americans who, when you ask, do you prefer a representative in Congress who stays true to their principles or who is willing to compromise, the number of people who say they're not willing to compromise uh, is at a pretty a reasonably high level. And so I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that means, but probably compromise on, on the issue, say, John brought up about trade-offs. If you can't compromise on trade-offs, then you've got problems. And we should take uh, maybe one or two more, yeah. In California, years ago, there was a very well-respected police chief and then a very well-respected mayor who ran for governor. And we thought he was going to become our first African-American governor. Yeah. But the next morning we awoke <clears throat> and he was not. Now, so apparently the in effect. California, the Bradley effect. Yeah. So, what do you think then? Um, might there be a Bradley effect, a gender effect, because the country just can't quite bring itself? Okay, so that's good. I got these questions in 2008. The Bradley effect is the following. What happened was in those days, when Bradley, Bradley is long ago, that what we did surveys, face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Now, you don't do that anymore because uh, the American National Election Study, uh, if you, we do 1,000, uh, we do 3,000 interviews face to face, the cost per interview is $1,000. $3 million. So we do it once and that's it. The Bradley, at the time of Bradley, it was a little uh, cheaper. So, Bradley, most of the people, most of the surveys in California at the time were person to person. And the Bradley effect was the following. About 15 to 20 percent of the interviewers were African American. And the Bradley effect was if it was an African American interviewing a white person, the white person would not say, I'm not going to vote for Bradley. They didn't, want to, they didn't want to see it as offensive. So that was the effect. So in surveys today where it's internet uh, or even random digit dial, uh, so there's no way anybody can know who's taking the survey. Uh, we don't get that. So was there a anti-Obama vote based on race in 2008 and 12? Sure. Uh, we got it. There were some people who voted for him for that reason. Some people voted against him. On average, it looked to us like it was a couple percent, maybe a couple percentage points. Is there, we have some research on women done by another Stanford graduate, uh, Jen Lawless, who heads American University's Women's Studies there, it looks like women get a little bit of advantage in primaries, and they look at a 1.5% to 2% disadvantage in the general election. So do I think that's there? Yes, I do. But do I think that will change the results that I've shown? No, I don't. But is there some, some uh, bias there? Yeah. And, and we will we'll have a better idea after the election when we can run these uh, various tests and stuff. Because then we'll know how people actually voted. And at this point, we're just, we're, we're hoping we're right. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much.